This week on People with Passion for Pets, we talk with Dr. Judy Morgan about pet nutrition and food therapy. Dr. Judy is a nationally renowned veterinarian certified in acupuncture, food therapy, and chiropractic care for cats, dogs, and horses. She is the author of four books and offers her online courses through her website, drjudyu.com. Well, welcome, Dr. Judy. Hello. (laughs) Hi, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yes, we are so excited to have you on our show, People with Passion for Pets. Welcome. Thank you. You really have a passion about teaching people to help their pets health through uh, nutrition mainly. How did you come across that? Did you you always do that? No. Um, So I, I went to a Midwest veterinary school back in the 80s. So traditional, traditional, there, there was no talk of weird things like acupuncture or, you know, making your pets food. And after a few years, I took a course in chiropractic, not realizing it was a chiropractic course. It was called veterinary orthopedic manipulation. I'm like, well, we can learn something here. Took the course, realized I'm learning chiropractic. I start practicing chiropractic. The changes in my patients were so astounding that I said, Ooh, there might be something to this holistic stuff. I might have to see what else is out there. So I started herbal therapy, acupuncture, like everything. I was trying to study everything, uh, you know, Japanese raindrop theory, like all these things, essential oils. And then I realized I didn't have the bandwidth to be able to do 17 different kinds of holistic medicine. So I took a course in acupuncture and um, it hit a hot button just traditional Chinese veterinary medicine in general. So there's four branches. We generally just think of acupuncture as uh, when we think Chinese medicine, okay, acupuncture. Well, the second branch is herbal medicine and that is huge. And Chinese herbs, um, you know, we have traditional Western herbal medicine, we have Chinese herbal medicine, and then we have Ayurveda, which is the Indian herbal medicine. So whichever one you speak to, it's all plant based basically. Um, It's just, I was studying acupuncture. So I went toward the traditional Chinese herbal medicine. The third branch is something called Tui Na, which is sort of a combination massage and chiropractic. And then the fourth branch is food therapy and using the properties of food to change things in our body. So there are certain foods, you know, when grandma always used to say, if you get a cold, have chicken noodle soup. Well, there's a lot behind that chicken noodle soup. And once you study food therapy, you realize why it works. Um, Medicinal mushrooms are maitake, uh, shiitake, reishi, uh, turkey tail, lion's mane. Medicinal mushrooms are so great for preventing cancer, so good for bowel health, so many things that we can learn. Well, when I started learning food therapy, it was like this aha moment went off. And Frankly, you can talk to any holistic veterinarian and ask them what is their favorite piece of holistic therapy that they utilize. And I would say without a doubt, we all have that one thing that we just gravitated toward. It was like, this is what I was meant to be doing. This is what I am on this earth to do. And mine was just food therapy. Like when I think of the energetics of a food, is it going to warm my body? Is it going to cool my body? Is it going to help drain the phlegm in my throat? Or is it going to make more phlegm? Is it going to make me feel bloated? Or is it going to you know, help me get rid of water? I can, somebody can ask me about a food and I can taste it. I can smell it and I can feel what it's going to do to my body. I don't know why. It's just, that's how I'm geared. Um, It's sort of like Dr. Melissa Shelton. I don't know if you know her, but she's an essential, she is the oily vet. She's an essential oil veterinarian. She gave up her traditional practice and all she does is essential oils. And that is her business doing essential oils. So each one of us has one thing that we are really drawn to. Um, And for me, it was the food therapy. So once I kind of started dabbling in that, it just took off. And uh, I have treated so many of my patients with food. And so food is always my, my first step in trying to heal a patient. Like, we've got to get them on a diet that matches what they need. 
if that's not strong enough, if, if they've deteriorated, you know, kind of past what we can do with the food, then we add in herbs because the herbs are just a more concentrated form of food therapy. And then we might add in chiropractic or Twina or massage or Reiki or some other, or acupuncture, some other energy type of healing. Um, so the, the great thing about holistic medicine is it's just more tools in the toolbox. Like my toolbox is so huge. It's like, oh, that didn't work. I'll grab this one. Oh, I, I need a little from here and a little from there. And so it's just, gives us a lot more to work with. That's that was a wonderful. long answer to that question. <laughs> that was a great answer. That's great. That's amazing, actually. It's not just about healing, though, right? It's also about maintaining, or is it just about healing? Both. So uh, we can take, uh, one of the great things about Chinese medicine is there are five personalities. So it holds true for people as well as animals. And on our website, we have two free downloads. One is a pet personality profile. So you can figure out your pet's Chinese medicine personality. And then there's a human personality profile and it lists, you know, emotions and illnesses and, you know, where you get your aches and pains, that sort of thing. And you just do the checklist for yourself and for your animal. And then you count up how many are in each column. And that gives you a really good idea of where your weaknesses are and what your main personality type is. And that's talked about in the yin and yang nutrition book as well. So if you know your pet's personality, then you can feed to support where their weaknesses are going to be. So that's why this is such cool stuff. And this was this, I didn't make this up. This was developed thousands of years ago. Um, and the fact that it still works thousands of years later, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of good evidence for, for this stuff working. So I, a lot of times will look at an animal. We got a new puppy came with, we only take the kids with problems, of course. So he came with a lot of problems. So I can look at his personality and I can look at the things that he was sort of standing in the wrong line for when they were giving out parts and pieces. And I can say, okay, well, how do I support him so that we get the best recovery, the best longevity? Um, so it's, the food therapy is used for a lot of things. Yes, we can take an animal, for instance, who has IBD or allergies or liver disease. And I can say, okay, well, we need to drain the liver. We need to support the immune system. Um, you know, animals with arthritis. Okay, well, we need to support the water system because that rules the bones. Um, but we can also take an animal that we know his personality and go, mm, you know, so for instance, a fire personality dog. Think of the, oh, you're a redhead. <laughs> Think of the, <laughs> the Irish setter. Um, redheads tend to be outgoing. They're a fire personality. They're joyful. They like to sing. They're also the life of the party. So if somebody's going to stand on the bar with a lampshade on their head, that's usually going to be the redhead. Um, and so we have dogs and cats that are also redheads. They're just, they're just full of life and energy and constantly going. Well, their water system, the kidney system, is the fire hose that has to put out the fire. So they're going all the time and they're draining that water element that is trying to keep it in check. Well, over time, if we fed the wrong foods, for instance, if we were feeding dry kibble, which is very drying to the body, it's like throwing paper on that fire and just burning them up, they'll go into kidney failure much earlier because we are using up their water system. So we can look at that animal and go, oh man, we better support that water system. We better help drain that fire system a little bit. Let's keep them a little more balanced. So that's why it's yin and yang. Yin and yang have to be in balance. And when one gets too, too far out of balance, that's when we get into trouble. So we can use food therapy, herbs, acupuncture, um, you know, exercise, mental, health, all of those things go into keeping that body in balance. That is so interesting. Yeah, you speak, you definitely speaking to my heart here. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we're more from, come from the training aspect and behavior issues, but that's some of the things that we see too. Sometimes it can be nutritional, uh, you know, can have a big value in helping dog combat some start. of the behavior issues and things yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got the fire dogs who, if they're just too hyped up, they can't listen. Like there, there's no way they can listen because they're just too busy having a party um, with everybody around them and themselves and whatever. So uh, by feeding foods that are going to be cooling, that, you know, that are going to bring their that fire, then we we make it so that they're able to focus. We also have the wood personalities and uh, think not not 100 of them fit into this category, but think German Shepherd, Rottweiler. They're like, yep. 
I'm pretty good at, you know, being a guard dog. I'm pretty good at doing that job. Don't put me in a corner because if you back me into a corner, I'm going to let you have it. Um, and those dogs are ruled by their liver and they get something called liver chi stagnation, which is energy, you know, that middle chakra thing. They get all their energy stuck right below the diaphragm in their liver and that causes uh, heat to flare up and they literally lose their minds. So uh, they're real, uh, I'm a wood personality. So I understand these guys really well. It doesn't mean I get along with them. It just means I understand them. Because uh, you put two woods together and we're going to butt heads. But um, that we're really good, but we're easily frustrated. So for instance, if you tell that, that Rottweiler, no, I want you to sit and stay. And the dog's like, I don't get why you want me to sit and stay. Like, this is just frustrating for me. I'm bored. I don't want to be here. They're going to act out because they don't get it. Um, then we've got the metal personalities who, uh, they are the best working dogs because they like all their ducks in a row. So if you want them to go do that agility course, they're going to do it perfectly because like, they hate to make mistakes. Like everything has to be perfect, but they hate changes in their routine. It's Apollo. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have a mini Aussie. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Mini Aussie definitely fits in that category. They tend to be the Merles, uh, you know, black and white or gray. Um, so they like to have everything exactly the same. And when you screw up their routine, they lose their mind. It's like, I, I, can't, I can't, no, we can't do it that way. <laughs> uh, the so, you know, they're, they're out of order. What do I do? <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, for those guys, that they don't necessarily like visitors to the house because it's like, no, you're a stranger. You don't belong yes. here. Like, yes. no, we have order. It's mom, it's dad. It's, you know, this kid, then this kid. It's me somewhere in there. And, you know, That's and it. They, yeah. they like to be herding dogs. They, they, they like to keep the kids in order, the cats in order, the sheep, whoever. Um, so this is why the medicine is so cool. And then we can feed them to try to get that personality a little more evened out so that they're not so like, ah. <laughs> yeah, water, that dogs, water dogs are the fearful dogs. They're the ones that are barking and growling while they're standing in the corner uh, before you ever get near them because they're mm. trying to scare you away because they're scared to death. Mm, yeah. And then the earth dogs are yellow Labradors that are so happy and everybody <laughs> else has to be happy. <laughs> We, uh, we had a, yeah. we had a Chesapeake Bay retriever that was definitely in an earth dog. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he was, he would yeah. sit up in the glaciers up in Montana and just float, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, one thing that speaks so much to me of, of what you teach on your online, um, you, you call it you online oh, university. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, and through your books and, and the way that you approach it is that it's not just there's not just one way and you know we we travel six months out of the year with our dogs in a fifth wheel and feeding raw is kind of a challenge for us but I love that you you know that because there's so many people that get um, into one particular area and they said oh no you must feed raw or you must you know do the barf thing or whatever <laughs> <laughs> but but you are you giving people options and you you really have uh a, like you said a lot in your toolbox you have to have options um so there are there are raw feeders who I, I find um and i'm a raw feeder but i do find that there are a lot of raw feeding groups online that frankly get very rude um and very mean and belittle people who don't feed raw for whatever reason. Um, you know, they're afraid of it because their veterinarian has told them to be afraid. They have an animal with an immune compromise that, you know, it worries them to feed raw food that might have bacteria in it. They have an immunocompromised person in the house, whatever. There's a lot of reasons. It's, it's inconvenient. It's messy. There's a lot of reasons that people won't feed raw. I get it. Um, so we have to give them options. Well, one of the great options that we have now is freeze dried raw. So uh, we have an RV, we used to have a fifth wheel, we have a class A, uh, and we used to be on the road a lot since before COVID we haven't been, but we used to be on the road a lot and we have a full size refrigerator freezer. I can take all the frozen dog food with me that I want, but I always have freeze dried as a backup in case I forget to thaw something out, in case we run out, whatever. So freeze dried is is in my armament. I also have uh, dehydrated base mixes that basically you add your own fresh meats to. So that's a third option to make it very easy. Um, don't have to worry about adding a bunch of supplements to balance things. 
Um, the gently cooked food for those who are afraid of raw, I have no problem with cooked foods using a base mix and your own cooked meats. Or uh, I have a recipe called pup loaf, which <laughs> is, is crazy worldwide popular. I never, I have no idea how it did that, but uh, the pup loaf recipe is on the website. It's in the books. It's, um, it's on a lot of Facebook and social media pages. Uh, it's a complete and balanced diet, but it has like 20 ingredients. So if you want to make a complete and balanced diet without using any supplements and you want everything to come from whole food, you're going to have a lot of ingredients. You can't do it with three ingredients. Um, and so that's scary for some people. And that's where having things like base mixes or having supplements. And that's why we made the homemade food for dogs 101 course so that it gives people the different options. Like here's, here's recipes that are complete and balanced. Here are recipes where you just have to add a couple of supplements. Here's a base mix and you can add your own meat so that it, it covers the spectrum for people. Uh, if you feed kibble and you're thinking, oh, I'd like to do some raw. So if, if somebody had kibble. Um, even if I was feeding kibble, I would be adding as much fresh food as I could because we have plenty of studies showing that we can increase longevity on our um, large breed dog, middle age or middle size and large breed dogs by two to three years, just by getting 30% fresh food in their bowl. What's a good starting point? Okay, I got a bag of 50 pound kibble over here, but when I feed, what can I do? I can go in the refrigerator and grab something. What, what's a good start for somebody to say, let me see how my dogs like this stuff. Okay, so we have lots of options. First, I'm gonna to speak to the 50 pound bag of kibble. So <laughs> kibble will develop storage mites uh, within three weeks. As soon as that bag is opened, it also starts going rancid the minute the bag is opened. So you want to only buy large enough bags of kibble to last three weeks. So if you have a bunch of large dogs and you have a 50 pound bag of food that you're going through in three weeks, no problem. But, uh, and then the other thing, mistake that people make with kibble, when you open a bag of kibble, you'll notice there's sort of a shiny lining inside the bag. And that is to keep out air and light because air and light are the enemies of kibble. Kibble is sprayed with fats. And when they're exposed to air and light, they oxidize and that's, and they, it becomes stale, but it also becomes rancid. And that's why we get so much pancreatitis on dry kibble fed animals. And people want to blame the fat content. It's not that it's the rancidity problem, plus the storage mites for allergy pets. So when you buy kibble, keep it in the bag. Do not dump it into one of those big plastic containers because now there's, especially if it's clear or white, there's sunlight getting in there. And every time you open it, there's air getting in there and you lost that coating that's inside the bag to keep it fresh. So you wanna keep it in the bag, roll it, squeeze all the air out, roll the top down, seal it tight every time you go in there to get food out of there. Okay, so that's my first thing. But uh, if, if you're going to feed kibble, let's make sure that we're feeding it as safely as possible. There's actually another free download on our website called Superfoods for Your Pets. And it's kind of to introduce what, what are great toppers that I could start putting on my dog's food that would actually be healthy and beneficial for them. So number one is eggs. Eggs are a superfood. They are pretty darn close to a complete diet by themselves. So this is what I say to people, like when we're on the road and I've run out of everything, I'm like, oh, do I have some eggs left? Good, the dogs are having scrambled eggs for breakfast. Great, good to go. Um, if you have a can of sardines, throw them in there with it. It's even better. Um, so and that's the second thing to go on the food, sardines. Canned sardines is that, are- I'm sorry, is that cooked? Is that cooked eggs egg, or raw eggs? So egg can be cooked or raw. Whatever your dog's like. I've been feeding mine raw eggs. We actually bought chickens and have eggs more for the dogs than for us. But um, I've been feeding them raw on their little platters. And they're so funny. They eat everything else first. And then they stand there and look at the egg. Like they can't figure out what, to, until you break the yolk, they're like, it just kind of rolls around. I don't know what to do with it. Um, <laughs> but they, they, they figure it out and they, they actually really enjoy it. But uh, you can use cooked eggs and hard boiled eggs are a great training treat because uh, you can break them apart. They don't do so well in your pocket, but you know, no one can break it apart. Um, so eggs are fine. And I don't care whether they're cooked or raw. It doesn't matter. I had one client with a dog, uh, with a St. Bernard, uh, eight month old puppy, very thin hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, the pet store puppy, just, you know, the parts and pieces weren't put together. Right. It was a disaster. 
Um, and I said, well, you know, eggs are one of the best foods to get this dog's bones to grow right and to support this dog and get the weight back on the dog. She fed that dog two dozen eggs a day for about six months, along with its other food. Man, that dog was beautiful. And she, well, I lost track of her when she was 13 and she never had lameness. Her hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia were horrible. She was never lame. Um, so we did so because that owner started when the dog was eight months old, she hadn't finished growing. And we gave her so much support with, you know, bone broth, eggs, fish, things that she needed to support that, that that dog lived a great life and wow. never had issues. This is why I like one, this so much. I guess I have one more question on the eggs, because I know that a lot of people uh, actually say that they should also eat the shells. They can. So the, the shells are a great calcium source. Um, I really, if I'm going to feed the shells to my dog, so they're used a lot for people that want to feed raw uh, but are afraid to feed ground bone or feed raw meaty bones. So they'll use eggshells because eggshells don't seem to be dangerous. Um, if you're going to use eggshell and you really want it to be absorbed for its calcium, uh, then it really needs to be ground into a fine powder for absorption. They can eat just the crunchy shells. I did an Easter egg hunt with my dogs one year and just, you know, put the hard boiled eggs and we dyed with natural vegetable dyes, threw them out in the yard. They were kind of like, it, we don't know what to do with this, but I have small dogs and they don't have many teeth. So, you know, for them, it was kind of like, Neat, but a big dog would crunch it down. No problem. So, um, so eggs, sardines, uh, I do sardines packed in water, pumpkin, uh, fresh or canned pumpkin, not pumpkin pie mix, but, uh, regular pumpkin blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, any kind of berries are super, super antioxidants, really healthy for them. Um, I am a huge fan of uh, organic coconut oil for my dogs. It's a uh, great anti-inflammatory. Um, I give my dogs fish oil um, and I rotate between salmon oil and sardine anchovy oil. Uh, almost all of my dogs have heart problems because of their breed. Uh, so that's a great antioxidant for the heart, great for brain health, particularly for senior dogs, great for joint health for any dog, but particularly working dogs um, or senior dogs. Uh, what else? Oh, mushrooms. I mentioned mushrooms earlier. Uh, for mushrooms, I really like those to be cooked because when we cook the mushrooms, it releases a lot more of the, the good stuff that's in there that, that has antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer effects and helps with gut health because it's a great fiber source for the bacteria in the gut. Um, closest I can find to a medicinal mushroom in my grocery stores is usually shiitake. Uh, portobello and white mushrooms don't have near the effect, but if that's all you can find, it's still going to be helpful. Um, and for the mushrooms, I like to chop those up and saute them in my coconut oil and then put that on the food. And the dogs love it. Uh, bone broth. Um, if you're buying a bone broth, make sure you're not getting one that has onions in it because that's not healthy for your dog. So we make our own. I have a recipe for that on the website as well. Really very simple. It just takes a while to, to do, but if you have a slow cooker, throw it in there and make bone broth. Um, so those are some of the, the easy starters. Um, but frankly, if you're having, you know, baked chicken, turkey, uh, pork loin, something that's not real fatty, um, pieces of whether it's cooked meat, uh, some people will do raw. Uh, you can top that on the food. That's no problem. The things you want to avoid are the gravies and the sauces and the skin and any cooked bones, none of the grease drippings from the pan. That's You're going to get pancreatitis because that's a cooked fat. Cooked fats cause pancreatitis. Raw fats do not. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. That, that is a great, yes. uh, lots of wonderful information. And again, um, on your website, there are so many free resources. So of course, we'll be sure to uh, put the links in the description below so Thanks. that the viewers and the listeners can get to those quickly. Thank you. I would say that a large percentage of allergy dogs if we just get rid of their kibble and put them on a homemade or uh, cooked or raw diet. And I mean, and it doesn't have to be homemade. There are a lot of pet food companies out there now offering gently cooked diets and complete raw diets. Um, we switched their diet and within a month, probably 75 to 80% of the symptoms that we had go away. You know, one of the <clears throat> things too is there, you know, there's so many people that would love to, um, probably feed their dogs differently but like you said in the beginning they're very afraid because there's so much information and it's very difficult 
to get your way through there and try to figure out how do you start and how do you make it to where it can also maybe not break the bank because right. a lot of these you know things that are now on the market can be very expensive. Yes. So I really I really highly recommend to anybody that's watching uh, to to look at your course the 101 for um, homemade dog food because um, it, it's just a wonderful starting point I think because it, there's so much information. Yeah, there's a, also a great resource, which is actually included in the Homemade Food for Dogs um, as a, a download, but Kimberly Gutierrez from Keep the Tail Wagging, uh, she's a blogger out in Washington, she actually put together a national list of co-ops and pet food companies that supply um, you know, a lot of the parts and pieces that we, you know, it, it's hard to find chicken gizzards sometimes. It's hard to find turkey liver sometimes. So, and we do like to include organs if we're going to do a homemade meal and we want it balanced with um, all whole food ingredients, we're going to have to get some organ meat. Yeah, and that is so true. Uh, you mentioned the co-ops and Facebook groups and, and we do have one here locally. And, and it is because again, there's people that are getting together and they're buying bigger quantities mm -hmm. together so that getting a much better price and then yep. they're obviously you know divvy that up between themselves so great great options great suggestions we put in a garden this summer and i've got an entire freezer and a half filled with vegetables from the garden um, which can go for the dogs and they can go for us um, and so that cost me you know packs of seeds um, so there's a lot of different ways if you have and i did it in a very small area um, I did not have, I mean, we have 23 acres, but <laughs> I was just starting. Um, <laughs> so our garden was not a huge area. Um, and it, and we had huge pest problems because I was trying to be organic and we still grew more than we, we were giving it away and I was freezing it. So, um, yeah. you know, there's lots of ways you can, you can kind of cut corners with things. And so you, you know, say, get a chicken coop. <laughs> yeah. So doc, Dr. Judy, you said um, vegetables. So, you know, as a lot of people oftentimes we talk to and when they talk about raw food, I know it's supposed to be a balanced diet, but um, are dogs supposed to have a lot of vegetables or are they more? Not a lot. With, okay. um, so there's two schools of thought on that. There's the uh, prey model raw PMR feeders who don't want to see any vegetable matter added. But if you look at the problem with that is if you want to be a prey model feeder and not add any vegetation, then you've got to feed body parts that we don't normally consider feeding. You've got to feed the head and the eyeballs and the hair and the stomach contents, which, by the way, are plant material. Um, it's a small percentage, but you need that. The hair has the trace minerals. Um, the stomach contents have the fiber and the vegetable matter that's broken down. So, uh, you know, the problem with saying, well, I'm just, I'm just going to feed him meat, bones, and organs, and you go get your ground beef and some beef liver and some eggshell that's not balanced, and it's not prey model because prey model encompasses a lot of parts of the animal that we don't generally use. Um, <clears throat> because people get kind of freaked out by it. What, you want me to feed hair? Why would, I, why would I feed hair? And one of the um, best things that I, I love for my dogs is whole ground quail. It's got the feathers. It's got the insides. It's got everything. Like, wow, that's pretty cool stuff. Uh, they love it. <laughs> it's, my cats love it. It's awesome stuff. Um, where was I going? Oh, vegetable. So uh, for my dogs, because um, I generally don't feed them hair and feathers, I just, I have once in a while, that's in their rotation. Their rotation is huge. Um, we have 30 different things in the freezer, um, at least. Uh, so generally, we look at anywhere from 12 to 20% of the diet being vegetable matter. Um, just kind of depends where you are. Um, for, for really um, old dogs with maybe compromised kidney function that can't handle and I don't restrict protein on my kidney dogs until they're pretty advanced, but for dogs that can't handle the high protein content, sometimes we'll add a little bit more vegetable matter. We might get up to 30%, 35, um, but that's not real common. Um, I usually stick in the 15 to 20% range. So that's where so, most of my recipes fall. Yeah. And so I think that's just so important for people to realize because I sometimes get people that, that want to start 
with a more natural diet for their dogs, but then they they become um, very limited, right? They always go yes. just with the same meat. Yes. And you just mentioned a word that's that rotation. So that's very important too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. My dogs don't eat the same thing hardly twice in a week. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think how many different proteins I have in my refrigerator. I think I have bison, venison, quail, chicken, turkey, duck, rabbit, beef, pork. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff in my freezer. Um, uh, pheasant, there's a lot of stuff in my freezer. Um, and so there's a lot of rotation and I just pull four or five pounds of frozen stuff out of the freezer, stick it in the fridge. And as it's thawing, I'm, you know, kind of rotating through, uh, and then I'm adding eggs, I'm adding fish. Um, so yes, tons of rotation. And like, when you look at my recipes, um, or if you see the platters that I feed my dogs on and see their food on there, I like to color the rainbow. So you are going to see some red, some green, some yellow, some orange, and you know brown, uh, some white. So we, if you're coloring the rainbow, you're getting a lot of the vitamins and minerals. Um, okay. And then when you're rotating, let's say I didn't have enough vitamin A today. Well, I add a little more liver or I'm adding some red peppers. I'm getting more vitamin A tomorrow. Um, and over the course of the week, it balances out pretty well. Uh, there are certain things that when people are making their own food, uh, the, the most commonly missed ingredients are a calcium source. So whether it's ground bone, ground eggs or eggshells, uh, or, you know, a, a seabed mineral, there's a lot of different calcium sources available. Most diets are low in vitamin D, which is found in fish and egg yolks, uh, and then trace minerals, zinc, iodine, manganese, very, very important for coat health, joint health, tendon and ligament health. So manganese is a trace mineral that most dogs with cruciate ligament tears are lacking. And so it, it's while I talk about rotation and not having to have every single meal balanced, I really support getting it balanced over the course of a week. Um, so that you're getting everything in there. And that's why that rotation becomes very important. And if you're worried about it, there's great supplements on the market. Um, there's a bunch on our website. And uh, the course talks about a, a lot of the different supplements that you can use to fill any holes in your diet. Um, as far as vitamin D, I actually do recommend that everyone has their dog tested for their vitamin D levels at least once a year. Uh, if they come up low, do it at least twice a year. Um, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin and it starts breaking down the minute it's exposed to anything. So pr processing, freezing, cooking, um, it, it just starts breaking down storage. It doesn't, it doesn't last very long. And while we can go out in the sun and convert vitamin D from sunlight, our dogs can't. Um, so we need to supply that and you can't use human supplements because they're too strong and too much vitamin D will put your dog into kidney failure and kill them. So don't start giving your supplements to your dogs. Um, but it is very important to test. So for instance, we had a client, she had two dogs, both the same size. One's a four-year-old, one's an 11 year old. They were both being fed a combination of a frozen raw diet that is complete and balanced on paper. And my pup loaf that is complete and balanced on paper. The, uh, healthy level of vitamin D would be hundred to 150. Her young dog came out at about 89 and her old dog came out at about 45. And she kind of blew up and said, I'm feeding complete and balanced diets. These are supposed to be complete. Why are my dogs low? Well, the diets are processed, even though they're minimally processed, they're processed because they go through a grinding process, they're stored. And then it starts to break down and notice the young dog had twice the level of the old dog. And that's just because the old dog doesn't convert it as well anymore. So that's the importance of testing. Even if you're feeding what is supposed to be a complete diet, you may need to supplement that, but you need to know how much to supplement. So that's why vitamin D testing is really important. Vitamin D and calcium work in conjunction together. So if one's low, the other one's gonna be messed up as well. We need calcium for good bones, good muscle strength, for nerve transmission, heart function, kind of important. <laughs> well, this has been uh, such a great interview, so much wonderful information. Um, and again, you know, on your website, there are so many free resources, but then again, there are your books, there are your online courses. So 
Um, share again where uh, our viewers and our listeners can find you. Oh, so many places. <laughs> uh, so our main website is drjudymorgan.com, drjudymorgan.com. And then our courses are on drjudyu.com. And my Facebook page is Judy Morgan DVM. Probably should change that to Dr. Judy, but it's Judy Morgan DVM as in doctor of veterinary medicine. Um, we have uh, thousands of videos on there. We do a Facebook live just about every morning. Uh, Monday through Friday. They used to be seven days a week. So the first few years we were doing them, you'll see them seven days a week. We've done them from up on Aspen Mountain. We've done them from Bermuda. We've <laughs> Everywhere we went, we did our Facebook Live talking about dogs and cats and, and pet health. So, um, you know, my goal is education of pet parents, which sounds like we're on the same train there. Um, we, we want pet parents to be empowered to uh, you know, be able to choose the right um, ways to raise their pets, to be able to have educated, good conversations with their veterinarians about what they do and don't want. Very, very, very important that you stand up for what you believe in. Um, in our case, it's minimal vaccination, uh, reduced or no use of chemicals, feeding uh, human grade foods, Many veterinarians are against raw feeding and homemade food. So, you know, that's something where we try to help you navigate that with your veterinarian because it's uh, uh, sometimes you can feel really cornered and not know how to to talk to them. And one of the courses that's in the works right now should be ready probably in a month or so is uh, a course on interpreting lab results. So when you get those lab results, you should always ask for a copy by the way, but when you get them and your veterinarian says it's all normal and all, everything's good and then you get it and you go, wait, there's six things that are not in the normal range. Uh, you can look at it and go, oh, well, that one's kind of not important. Oh, well, that might mean that. Maybe I should call them up and ask. And at least you'll be educated to have that conversation of, okay, well, what about this, 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 and this? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, so really important that pet owners feel empowered um, and that you're in the driver's seat. Awesome. Thank cool. you again so much. It was, Thank you. It was very cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Bye now. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today on People with Passion for Pets. We're Jim and B. Walker, and we share the adventure of life with our dog Apollo and Heidi. For more adventure videos, check out our YouTube channel, Modern Canine Vlog, or visit our website, www.mcs.dog. And until next time, keep your paws on the road.